Good evening and welcome to the Center for Strategic <coughs> International Studies. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm our Senior Vice President for External Relations. And uh, I want to welcome all of you to CSIS on behalf of both the Center and Texas Christian University. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Larry Lauer, the uh, Dean of uh, the Vice Chancellor uh, for Government Relations here from TCU. So we have some horn frogs in the house. And as many of you follow the football team, they had a great game on Saturday night. Uh, and Bob's got his spirit here because he's got his socks on. Um, this is an absolutely fascinating topic and there's nobody better here to do it than this panel. And I'll leave it with that. Bob, please uh, enjoy. Well, thank you all very much on behalf of uh, TCU and the Seaford School of Journalism and CSIS, one of the great partnerships of this century. Uh, Tom Friedman was there when the uh, naming took place, and we really do have a great panel. Tom, of course, has won more Pulitzers than anybody in Washington. How many? You're up to three now? Yeah, three Pulitzers. <laughs> He's written five best-selling books in a row, and uh, not many people have done that. Mort Abramowitz. Uh, Ambassador to Turkey, Ambassador to Thailand, uh, once uh, president of the Carnegie Endowment, held all kind of academic. Written no bestsellers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, scholastic positions, and Bulit Alizra, uh, Alariza. And uh, he is uh, the founder of the Turkey Project here. Uh, he's seen often on television, on the op-ed pages, uh, writing about Turkey, and uh, a true expert on it. I, th I thought, before we get down to Turkey, per se, that I would just get Tom to give us kind of a little overview of what's going on in the region out there. Tom? Well, thanks, Bob. It's great to be here. Um, you know, I, I would just say, generally speaking, when it comes to the uh, Arab awakening, uh, which is really the regional context within which Turkey is, is, uh, is both emerging and, um, and acting today, uh, I think there's one prediction I, I would feel safe in making, and that is that uh, as far as the Arab world is concerned, stability has left the building. Um, and uh, when we're thinking about whether it's uh, Tunisia uh, or Egypt um, or Yemen or Syria or Bahrain, uh, the only question I have in my mind is which kind of instability uh, are we going to see over the coming decade? And I think this is going to take a long time <coughs> to play out. That is, will it be instability that has a positive slope? and bring these individual countries toward a kind of Indonesia, South Africa transition to democracy? Uh, or will it have a negative slope um, and lead to a kind of Somalia, Pakistan outcome with some kind of military group taking over? Um, I think that's still just very, very much in play. I, I think that the, as much instability as we've seen in, uh, in the region <coughs> and change and Lord knows I, I'm a big supporter of the, you know, all these democracy movements. Um, but we have seen nothing until it hits Syria. Because basically, my own rule of thumb is uh, Tunisia implodes, Egypt implodes, Yemen implodes, Bahrain implodes, Syria explodes. Um, uh, if the regime there collapses uh, or is brought down by, um, uh, by military force, uh, that will pull in uh, necessarily every uh, key power in the region. That will be Iran via Hezbollah in Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, uh, Turkey, uh, and Iraq. And um, we will really see a mini version of the great game there. And so I think that's really the, 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 the most important thing right now. I think that's probably number one, uh, Bulent can tell us on the, uh, or that probably, and, and the fate of Iran's nuclear program, probably number one and two on, uh, on the Turkish foreign policy agenda. Because of course, if Syria collapses, there is the real potential there for um, a Kurdish safe haven um, in Syria, and particularly uh, of the PKK variety um, which poses, uh, uh, in the Turkish view, is certainly a threat to their, to their future. And um, uh, we're off to the races. So I, I think uh, as much as we've seen an unstable Middle East up to now as a result of the Arab awakening, a, a, an instability that was necessary and, and I think and hope will be positive in the long run, we have seen nothing uh, until you've seen Syria blow. Uh, that will be a volcano. So, what uh, 
what, how does that impact Turkey, and how will Turkey view that, and what will Turkey do? Well, Tom mentioned Syria, and Syria was really the crown jewel of Turkey's opening to the, to the uh, Arab Middle East. For a very long time, Turkey looked uh, primarily to the West, naturally, because it was an ally of the US. It was a member of, of NATO. And it, uh, it ignored the, the, uh, the lands to itself for a very long time. Now, even before the current government came into office in 2002, there was a lot more interest in the, in the Arab world, but uh, it accelerated during the past nine years of the, of the current government. And the zero problems policy that was enunciated uh, by uh, uh, this government um, really focused more on Syria than uh, any other. It, uh, it has a long border with Syria. Um, it's one of the two Arab countries that uh, Turkey borders, the other being, being Iraq. Um, and uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, Turkey is uh, um, has been able to uh, achieve a rapprochement with, uh, uh, with uh, Syria uh, was really a uh, matter of great pride for Prime Minister Erdogan. Now what we've in fact seen is a great tension between Turkey and Syria following on the events in Tunisia, Egypt, um, and uh, of course there was also Bahrain and, and Yemen. When it came to, to Syria is when uh, the, the Arab Spring, the convulsions that Tom talked about in the, in the Arab world, really began to, to uh, uh, affect Turkey. One, a lot of refugees um, came into Turkey um, as the uh, crisis unfolded in, in Syria. Uh, there was uh, is a great deal of disaffection between Prime Minister Erdogan and uh, Assad of, of Syria because Assad simply would not undertake the reforms that he promised uh, Mr. Erdogan. And third, of course, is the, is the uh, Kurdish issue. Uh, there is now a lot of suspicion in, in Turkey that Syria has uh, reassumed the role that it, it played in the past, which is that the, uh, of a sponsor of PKK terrorism against Turkey. Now, the PKK is based in northern Iraq. But as I said, there's suspicion that not only Syria, but now Iran uh, may also be using the, the PKK card against Turkey uh, in order to ease the pressure by Turkey on, on Syria. And also, uh, because Iran is unhappy with the fact that Turkey has agreed to base the, the radars associated with the missiles on its territory. So the great game uh, that Tom, Tom talked about is really on the way. And there's a great deal of coordination between Ankara and Washington um, uh, as the uh, Arab Spring has been unfolding. But ultimately, <coughs> it's Turkey sitting where it sits, bordering Iran and Syria, and the, the possible uh, instability that may still await us in, in Iraq as we proceed into the future. Or how does Turkey see itself now in Prime Minister well, Erdogan? Let me just say, if Tom's uh, scenario comes to pass, Turkey's going to be scared as hell. That's what's going to happen. They're going to be scared of an influx. Uh, they got a small, relatively small influx the first time, 15, 20,000 people. And uh, this one will be much bigger. Uh, they'll be worried about uh, uh, what happens with the Kurds, but unless I'm less concerned about that because I think there are going to be so many other bigger issues than the Kurds so that the uh, Turkey will always be worried about the Kurdish situation in Iran, Syria, and, 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 and uh, Iraq. But on this score, there are so many other bigger issues involved than just the Kurds. Uh, so uh, uh, what Turkey will do in the circumstances uh, what the United States, what anybody will do. You, you also mentioned, you never forgot to mention Saudi Arabia is going to be yeah. deeply yeah. interested in this and will start playing around. So you have a, you have a wild card going on uh, with the, the impact on Turkey being extremely worried and there's going to be great criticism, I believe, in this case of Erdogan, the Prime Minister, because one, he started out dealing with an authoritarian government and, and and, and praising authoritarian government, he quickly switched to supporting democracy. And now the whole thing is falling apart. Uh, Turkey's going to have a, he's going to have a difficult problem knowing how to deal with them. And he's going to come under, I think, serious criticism. I may be wrong on that score. Uh, but it, it opens up a totally different, a different world. One thing. Now, now what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> That's, you answered it. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Something's going to happen pretty soon, Tom. U.S. troops are going to be out of Iraq by the end of this year. Uh, 
is Turkey, will they seek a larger role as the U.S. departs? And, and what, how does the United States feel about it? My suspicion is the United States wants them to seek a, a, a larger role. Yeah, I think the United States looks at um, Turkey as a, as a stabilizing force you know, in Iraq well, on, on several grounds. One is um, they uh, can provide assurance um, to the uh, Sunni community there uh, and be a friend um, in court for Sunnis as they try to um, hold their weight against uh, the Shiite majority. That's number one. Number two, the, the Turks and the Kurds of, of Iraq, not the PKK, but the, the, uh, uh, the two Kurdish parties in Iraq that, that rule Kurdistan there, um, have really developed intimate economic links mm -hmm. and um, uh, really overcome their problems. And uh, they've been, I think, both quite smart about it. The Kurds have invited uh, Turkish contracting companies to do um, a good deal of the building of, uh, of Kurdistan, and there's enormous trade now. And so uh, Turkey will, will definitely be, be playing a role there as well. And Turkey, um, you know, if, if you just, um, uh, you know, took the names and dates off here, we, we could be right back in the, you know, in the 1500s here because basically the Ottoman Turks will balance off the uh, Iranian Persians. And once we are out, there will be a huge struggle between Turkey, uh, Ottoman Turkey, and, uh, and, and Persia for um, influence in uh, Iraq. And if we are smart, uh, that is a competition we can play to our advantage. Uh, without having troops on the ground. Uh, I'm also a big believer that once we're out of Iraq, um, we've deflected, been a, been a lightning rod for enormous amount of Iraqi anxiety about, um, about being occupied by a foreign power uh, and the like. And um, once we are out, uh, I think a lot of that anxiety will focus naturally on Iran. And I have um, a thousand years of history that says, um, you know, uh, Arab, uh, Shiites and Iranian Shiites don't play well together. And so um, I think that Iran will have a much more complicated problem in trying to influence Iraqi politics once America is gone. Uh, it will be seen as a regional hegemon, and um, Iraqi politicians that are seen as too close to Iran or its cat's paw, I think will have in time problems within Iraqi politics. Do you see the Iraqis being able to maintain a unified state? I think that's a, uh, an open question, Mort, but if there's one thing, and I would make no prediction about it, but if there's one thing we've seen about Iraq um, you know, since, the, uh, since 2003, they've gone to the brink so many times, you know, it, it's hard to, uh, to count them anymore. And every time they've pulled back, um, at the end of the day, um, there's turned out to be enough Iraqiness, uh, as it were, for the parties um, to pull back. Now, we played an important role in that. Um, but at the end of the day, they did it. And so I, I would make no predictions about that. I mean, you have to say the place is held together. I, I think the, the, the larger point that, that is, is sort of sobering is when you think about, if you think about all these Arab countries that, have, that are now in the process of, of awakening, uh, and the transition to democracy they all want to and need to make, and we have to root for them to make. And then think about Iraq. I mean, what did it take in Iraq? Uh, it took uh, 4,900 American dead, 20,000 wounded, a trillion dollars, uh, seven years, a civil war where all the parties <laughs> tested each other's power. What you got, baby? What you got? Okay. Then we um, pulled them together to write a social contract, stir, bake for two years, and pray that it rises. So that was all done, basically, with the help of an American midwife. Now you can have a half a dozen other countries trying to make the same transition from autocracy to democracy with no midwife. And that's, uh, I think, going to be a huge challenge. And that's where maybe Turkey could play a role in our absence. Well, one of the things here is that the, uh, the US, uh, despite Turkey's severe differences with Israel. Uh, the U.S. has very significantly compartmentalized its relations with Turkey and with Israel. Mm -hmm. It puts, a, and Obama himself personally, from everything I've heard, puts great store in Turkey's role 
in the Middle East in this extremely uncertain period. And in Iraq, I think uh, uh, we're looking to Turkey to re uh, sort of remarkably make sure the Kurdish state survives as an entity. And we're looking for uh, Turkey to uh, try to, to limit uh, Iranian influence in Iraq. So the United States has got a different relationship with Turkey than it's had for a long time. Turkey's ability to confront Iranian influence or to limit Iranian influence in, in Iraq is limited. Uh, its primary influence uh, is in the north. And in the, the moment that you cross from Turkey into Iraq, you're in the Kurdish regional government. And Turkey does not officially recognize the Kur Kurdish regional government as such, but deals with it. And the problem there is that uh, the, the more the PKK attacks Turkey, the more Turkey feels compelled to put pressure on the Kurdish regional government to do something about the PKK. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the US, when it was in uh, or the, the occupying power in Iraq, did not do anything about uh, the, the PKK. It's right out the corner, uh, uh, northern corner, of northwestern, eastern corner of Iraq, right where it abuts Iran, and it's a difficult terrain. Uh, the central government in Iraq, obviously, uh, did not have the power to do anything about it, and the K KRG, the Kurdish regional government, has not done anything about it. Recently, the Turks have hosted the, the president of the, the Kurdish regional government, Mr. Barzani, the foreign minister of Iraq, who is actually Kurd, Hoshar Zabari, and have been putting pressure on them to do something about this. Now, Tom is right. There is a great deal of trade and, and economic, uh, strong economic relationship between Turkey and northern Iraq. But that could be endangered by uh, the PKK violence and the inability of the KRG to do something about it. So if Turkey is going to play a role in, uh, in Iraq and maintaining Iraqi stability, uh, we have to look at the possibility that that could really be endangered by PKK violence. Uh, the relationship between the President and Erdogan has been described as a model partnership. Uh, do you think it is? Well, actually, Tom Donnell, the National Security Advisor, described it as an intense relationship, which is an unusual way to describe a relationship between two leaders. Uh, 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 now, the, the model partnership that uh, President Obama mentioned when he f made his first visit to Turkey in April 2009 and by the way, it was his first overseas uh, bilateral visit. So obviously, he, uh, as Mort says, he, he, uh, he regards Turkey as a very important component of his foreign policy. He obviously wanted uh, uh, Turkey to play the role, as he described it in the model partnership, of being a bridge between the two worlds it belongs to. Uh, it's linked to the West, but it's also linked to the, to the Middle East and the wider Islamic world. Now, Turkey obviously wants to play that role. Mr. Erdogan has been uh, keen uh, to, to, to play that role. Uh, for a long time, um, Tom, you've been following this, Turkey was able to do what the U.S. was not willing to or was unable to do, which is to talk to Tehran and Damascus. Now, uh, we have a situation in which both Syria and Iran are not exactly comfortable with uh, Turkish closeness to the, to the U.S., and we're getting to a situation in which uh, you know, uh, uh, the bridge is coming under pressure from both sides. The U.S. wants Turkey to play an increasing role as a stabilizing force in the, in the Middle East, and there's pushback from these two countries, as well as the, uh, uh, some of the groups associated with them, for example, like Hezbollah in, in, in Lebanon, we're not comfortable with the role that uh, Turkey is playing. So we're really going into a, a very interesting period in which uh, we will see uh, a, a test of Turkey's influence in the Middle East. Well, uh, if Iran is a little uncertain about it, what about Russia? for example, what, how, how would they feel about Turkey assuming a larger role? Well, it's interesting that Turkey has, has developed good relations with uh, both Russia and, and Iran. In fact, we're doing a study at, at CSIS uh, at, uh, it, of the triangular relationship between Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Now, Turkey is obviously part of NATO. Uh, NATO was created to confront the Soviet Union, which dissolved and, and left Russia and the other 14 former Soviet republics uh, behind. Uh, the Turkish-Russian economic relationship is very strong. It's based on, on energy, uh, primarily gas that uh, Russia is supplying. Uh, there's a similar uh, situation with Iran. Iran supplies gas into Turkey. Both Russia and Iran have a trade advantage, um, a trade balance advantage with, uh, in their dealings with, with Turkey. So there are limits to what Turkey can do in confronting Russia and the Caucasus or Iran uh, elsewhere because of, of this strong economic relationship. Now, Russia. Uh, uh, was unhappy with the, with the missile deal, uh, the missile project, and, and Turkey's willingness to host the radars. But it ha hasn't gone beyond a certain limit because if uh, Turkey controls itself as it deals with Russia, the Russians also control themselves as they react to what Turkey is doing. Let's talk about uh, Iran. 
and uh, Turkey's approach to that. Uh, is, is Turkey's approach different or about the same as the United States' approach? And, uh, no, I think, uh, I think uh, Turkey does have a different approach still. Uh, Turkey is very reluctant to get into a huge hassle with Iraq. Uh, Iran. It, Iran. I mean, Iran, rather, I'm sorry. Very reluctant, uh, very dismayed being caught in the middle here between uh, the United States and the West and, and the increasing pressures uh, to do something about uh, stopping an Iranian nuclear weapon. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the Turkish-Iranian relationship has really weakened. You know, Syria has been a big, a big acerbating factor in, dis in limiting uh, the, or, in, or in loosening the Serbian, the, the Iranian-Turkish uh, uh, connection. Uh, there are problems also whether uh, Iran is screwing around with the PKK and possibly affecting uh, Turkey's own internal situation. Uh, so I think over time, the Turkish-Iranian relationship has loosened. It is not loosened to the extent that Turkey is yet willing, it's certainly not willing to support any military action against Iran. And I don't know to the extent to which it would cooperate in severe sanctions against Iran. I personally don't think Turkey's a major factor on what we do about Iran. I think it's a minor factor. That's no, my own view. Well, what do you all think about the that? differences were on the line last year when uh, the US uh, put forward a, a, a new set of sanctions at the UN. Turkey was on the Security Council at the time. And despite uh, a 45-minute phone call from President Obama to Prime Minister Erdogan, Turkey voted against it. Turkey then, together with Brazil, tried to come up with a, with a separate uh, uh, deal, which the US uh, was not willing to, uh, uh, to support. Uh, the, the trade mode is right. I mean, there, there has been a weakening of the relationship. Uh, and yet, Turkey is about to open a new border post, a border, cr border crossing uh, for Iranian and Turkish trade. Because Turkey is Iran's opening to, to the West. At a time when it's isolated, uh, increasingly isolated, uh, there is a limit beyond which Turkey is not willing to go. And uh, even if the relationship worsens, uh, I'm not sure that Turkey will be wholehearted and supportive of, of new sanctions. I don't well, think we're going to be limited in what we do by Turkey on Iran. I simply don't believe they are a, a, a major influence on American policy toward Iran. So I, if uh, President Romney decides to bomb Iran, well, uh, Turkey won't be for that or will be <laughs> Well, so even if they're not for it, what are they going to do about it? <laughs> Well, yeah, I'd, I'd say a couple of things. I, I think the United States and Turkey are doomed to be friends um, here for, um, for uh, the near future, and, and Obama and Erdogan, uh, because I think that uh, given the kind of instability we're going to see in the Arab world, and particularly with our traditional allies, Turkey remains a hard power. It is a NATO member. It's got a vibrant economy. Um, we have a long relationship with it. And we are going to be depending on Turkey a lot. Um, and, and so I, I think we're, we're going to have to get along, and we will get along. And that's why the administration's been very smart in separating the U.S.-Israel relationship um, and the U.S.-Turkey relationship and just keeping them on, on, uh, on separate tracks. And um, uh, as far as Iran is concerned, you know, I think that the one thing that uh, I think I agree with Bulent, there's enormous commercial ties between the two countries. Uh, uh, I, I, the Turks evidently are, are resigned to the fact of Iran you know, uh, getting a nuclear weapon. They've lived next to a nuclear Russia all these years. Um, at the same time, though, given where the Sunni Arab Muslim world is on the Iran question, uh, if Turkey wants to continue to have influence in the Arab world, um, it will have to balance that relationship with Iran with, its, uh, with the ties and aspirations and interests of the Sunni Arab world as well. And uh, Erdogan will not be able to dance at both those weddings, uh, not indefinitely. Does, does uh, Turkey still want to be part of the European Union, or where, where is all that now? Well, I think we got to the point that, uh, uh, that uh, one could say that the process is stalled. Um, you know, uh, recently, I, I was talking about this, and I said, 
the Russians used to, during the Soviet days, used to have a saying, they pretend to pass, so we pretend to, to, uh, to work. Uh, the European Commission pretends that there is an pro ongoing process, and the Turks pretend to believe it. Uh, Turkey will not give up the, the uh, EU process because the massive domestic transformation has been done with reference to the, to the EU accession process. But I, I'm convinced more, uh, uh, more and more that uh, Turkey just does not want to be um, a, just another EU country. Uh, it prefers to focus on its relationship with uh, Washington than with Brussels. Uh, there is great tension uh, in the relationship uh, between uh, Turkey and Germany and Turkey and France because of the, these two countries' opposition to Turkish entry. And you know, those two are, are, the, are the dynamos of, of the EU, and the EU has massive problems. So Turkey at this moment is, uh, is still proceeding as if it wants to be a member, but uh, frankly, uh, uh, that seems more and more unlikely than ever before. And what about uh, Turkish-Israeli uh, relations? Uh, where, is, where is that and what does it mean to the rest of the I, I don't see any, any short-term improvement in Turkish-Israeli relations unless there comes into play because of sort of the type of factors Tom has raised which would, would change that. I think uh, Erdogan has a deep animosity toward Israel, uh, but he's also a practical politician. Uh, and he also wants a very, a very close relationship with the U.S. So I think that right now, that, that is mostly frozen. Uh, and one of the things that interested me in this regard has been that despite the virulence of the Turkish-Israeli relations, uh, at the time that Mr. Erdogan came to the United States, that note that the U.S. Congress did nothing, that the Armenians did nothing, that arms, con arms supplies continued on to, to, uh, to Turkey, and we just sold them three very important helicopters. And I believe that's largely a function of the Israeli government not wanting to exacerbate any further the Israeli-Turkish relationship. And they all laid off trying to undermine Erdogan. I can't prove that, but I think that's a factor. And I think any way that Israel can restore the relationship is deeply in Israeli interest. You know, I, I to say that uh, there are 22 members of the Arab League. I love every one of them. <laughs> but we don't need a 23rd. And if Turkey decides that it wants to go so far as to, in effect, become the 23rd member of the Arab League, uh, it would be a huge strategic mistake for Turkey because Turkey's influence and its relevance um, in the region and vis-a-vis -vis the United States was as a bridge between, and, and Erdogan was an active mediator between Syria and Israel uh, in the Olmeric government. Um, I think it's too bad that uh, the United States uh, painstakingly, uh, with lawyers from the Israeli government, worked out a deal uh, to overcome the whole, uh, uh, you know, flotilla, Gaza flotilla incident. Uh, it, it, would, it, it didn't even involve really an apology so much as Israel expressing regret. Um, and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu turned it down because he was afraid that uh, he went against his own legal team not to mention our Secretary of State, uh, because he was afraid that it would um, leave him exposed politically to his arch rival, uh, the Foreign Minister, uh, Lieberman. And so, um, you know, it, 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 this is going to grind on for a while. I, I'm a big believer that geography is destiny. Uh, Turkey and Israel are, again, doomed to be friends, uh, given the geography of the Middle East, um, these two non-Arab powers. And find, they'll find a way to get back to it at some point. I'm more pessimistic about this because yes, yes. Uh, the, it, w you talked about uh, President Romney ordering uh, an attack on, on Iran. Um, you know, during the past two weeks, we've seen speculation that Israel might attack Iran. If that happens, then you're going to get a reaction, certainly from the Turkish public and certainly from the, uh, from the Turkish government, even if you know, privately uh, the elimination, the possible elimination of is uh, Iran's nuclear capability uh, might be welcomed. Uh, and also, with respect to what uh, Mort was saying, now, um, 
since the arms embargo on, on Turkey imposed by Congress in 1974 because of uh, Cyprus, um, uh, Turkey relied on the Friends of Israel in Washington to help protect it against the Armenian Genocide Resolution and all, on all sorts of issues. Now, that relationship is, is certainly not what it was. And if we were to get a, a, another test, let's say with another Armenian Genocide Resolution in, in Congress, it may be that Turkey will not find that support from, uh, uh, from the Friends of Israel. And that's a factor that any president will have to take into account. Uh, we want to take some questions from the audience. But while you're thinking of a question, I want to circle back to where we started, in Tom, and talking about Syria. You're talking about what could happen if uh, Syria falls. What are the chances Syria will fall? I mean, what, what do you all see happening there? You know, this is, um, uh, this is a regime that not only is uh, it's ready to kill as many people, it's already proven that, um, as it needs to, to stay in power. Um, the Alawites have nowhere to go. This is not like the Ben Ali family in Tunisia that, um, you know, this is 10% of the population that would feel very exposed um, uh, should it lose its, you know, primary place in power there. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I think it's, it's very complicated. I think, the, uh, yeah, I think the tipping point will come when you see the Sunni bourgeoisie of Damascus and Aleppo uh, basically abandon the regime. And so far, they, they haven't done that, I think, because they're terrified of instability as well. So this, this, uh, this could grind on for a long time, and, and it could not. You know, I mean, it's just uh, it's hard to see how this ends in a, in a kind of clean, stable way. So I, I, I am, I'm befuddled by it. Do either of you have anything no. to add on that? But let me ask you, what happens if, uh, Tom, if uh, Assad does survive, which is a real possibility that this does peter out? Unlikely, perhaps, but a real possibility. What are we left with? If, we have Assad in power sort of indefinitely. Uh, I don't really know. I think it, it more grinding. Again, he's got the Iranians <laughs> buttressing him. He's got Hezbollah buttressing him. Um, he's got the Alawites buttressing him. And so he, 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 has, he has resources that are keeping him clearly in power. And again, I think the, where, where the Sunni merchant class is, is is critical, and they have yet to clearly abandon him. So he's got the Iraqis, again, you know, supporting him. Um, we have this weird situation where the uh, uh, elected government in Iraq is supporting basically the dictatorship in Syria now. So, um, and that is for purely Shiite reasons, because uh, they're worried about the Sunnis taking over. Um, and underlying this whole story is the oldest civil war in the world uh, between Sunnis and Shiites. Um, it's the unspoken, um, it's the elephant in the room, and it really is driving uh, so many things uh, and so many behaviors. And, it's very, uh, very unpredictable. I, I would not hazard a guess. I, I don't know how it's going to play out. My gut tells me he's dead man walking and that, um, uh, that this can't go on um, indefinitely and that if for no other reason the Alawites may decide to throw him under the bus in order to save themselves with what is sure to be the future you know, Sunni majority in Syria, that seems like a, a real possibility. But I, I, again, I would make no predictions. <coughs> All right, questions. Right here. Uh, I wonder if uh, Tom Friedman could. I wonder if. Is this on? Yes. Yeah. I wonder if Tom Friedman could amplify and perhaps clarify something uh, you said right at the very beginning mm -hmm. because it scared me. Uh -huh. Maybe it was intentional. Uh, as I understood it, uh, you said that unlike the other elements of the Arab Spring, which, we, which were implosions, uh, uh, something in Syria would be an explosion, bringing in, you ticked off a number of countries, but they included both Iran and Israel. Uh, now, I have my doubts that Israel could resist a full court military press by Iran. So if you disagree with that, I wonder if you could explain why. But if you agree, uh, are you projecting the first use of nuclear weapons since 1945? I personally don't think that Israel would use nuclear weapons uh, to, to block the development of nuclear weapons in Iran. But certainly if there well, were so military let me, let me start, well, that you're, I'm, you're way off from what I was saying. I'm, I wasn't suggesting nuclear anything. All, all I'm, uh, the simple point I was making is that uh, 
Syria is the keystone, the, the geopolitical keystone balancing okay, uh, all of these states, uh, Turkey, uh, Syria, Iran, uh, Israel, uh, Iraq, Turkey, and if that keystone collapses, okay, each of those states is going to uh, look to secure its interests uh, in Syria in a way that will look for allies, uh, that will, you know, will look for partners there uh, to protect its, if nothing else, its border. Think of, think of how many border countries Syria borders on. But it has nothing to do with what, not Israel military. using a nuclear weapon um, uh, in, in any way. I, you know, I, I wouldn't even contemplate that in the Syrian context. Next one, right here. Hi, uh, Daniel Lakin from the Korea Economic Institute. Thank you for the wonderful discussion so far. What are you doing here? Um, <laughs> also, very. Did you not, you're, you're confused what room this also is. Also, very interested in. Uh, I'm only an intern, but also very interested in the Middle East. Okay. So, just on, under my own power. Um, <laughs> So uh, someone uh, earlier, I believe it was uh, Mr. Friedman, mentioned uh, the, uh, on the Arab awakening and the fact that these countries have no midwife to democracy like uh, Iraq did through American uh, presence and occupation. Um, I was wondering if Turkey might have any role to play in that. No, uh, there hasn't been any Turk pro professed Turkish desire to play a democracy promotion role or exporting its own system of government. But at the same time, there's been a lot of buzz about Turkey's unique uh, Islamist form of, uh, at least the AKP and its, and its mix, its style of governing and Turkish style democracy. Now, do, you, do any of you see? Um, I, I think given the history of Ottoman Arab relations, the idea of Turkey playing any kind of active midwife role would be highly unlikely. I think Turkey's role would be as a model uh, of, of blending Islam and democracy. But any kind of active role, I think the Arab world would recoil at. I, I'm not sure you're right on that, Tom. Okay, good. I no, think uh, the AK Party is very active in in helping Islamic parties uh, throughout the area. I agree with Tom that the model is is very important, and I think Turkey is a genuine model. Turkey's been a model for 30 years. Once it was a model. Uh, uh, for military rule, and it still could be a model for Egypt. But, but uh, I think, though, that um, on, on, on this score, uh, I don't believe Mr. Erdogan is averse to trying to sort of move the equation a little in, in terms. Now, that doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. He still brings a secular perspective to Islamic parties. I'm just saying, I'm not sure they're going to stand aloof from involvement in the domestic politics of some Arab countries. We're going to see how, uh, how influential Turkey is as the, the process unfolds. I mean, I agree with Tom that ultimately it's going to be the Arabs themselves and the individual Arab countries within the Arab world that will determine their, their future. But if Turkey is a model, uh, to follow on from what Mort is saying, it is a model uh, for the Islamists who, was pre who were previously shut out of the system. Uh, we've seen Rashid Ganoushi, the head of the Anahta party, which just won the elections in Tunisia, referring to the Turkish example. Uh, we've seen similar statements from, uh, from Egyptian uh, Islamists. Um, and uh, the, the model that the AK party, which has its roots in political Islam in Turkey, uh, albeit uh, uh, willing to operate within a secular system, um, brings to the Arab world is that of a route to power through the ballot box. Now that raises, or should raise, questions in, in, in Washington as to whether uh, Mr. Obama's dialogue with Mr. Erdogan about bringing these parties in uh, is ultimately in the U.S. interest. Because remember what happened in, in, Ham uh, in Gaza when Hamas won. Uh, uh, essentially, Washington cut off co contact with Hamas. Now, is, has the U.S. decided that it, it's willing to deal with Islamist parties once they gain power, uh, and particularly if they begin to behave in, in a manner that is um, deemed unacceptable in Washington. Yeah, I think there's another point you know, we have to really keep in mind when we talk about the Turkish model. Um, it's unspoken you know, uh, and, and, to me, underappreciated. Uh, Turkey is a, is a, had no natural resources. Okay? It had no oil. 
Uh, and because of that, it developed a very vibrant free market merchant class, a really, really impressive, uh, I, I would say, um, uh, export model um, and uh, uh, a, a real active business elite. And so when you talk about the e EKP and their success, it isn't just that they somehow miraculously blended Islam and democracy, okay? Underlying it is that they created an incredibly powerful economic engine. And that's really what's allowed and enabled uh, a lot of not only their success, but their influence to spread. And it's not just a question of, of copying the, the religious democracy balance, but you also have to copy the free market thing. And that's going to be a real challenge. I mean, in the Arab world, you have all these rent-seeking you know, um, uh, parties, very little authentic entrepreneurship. And uh, don't underestimate that um, as, a, uh, as something holding them back. And that it's not just about balancing you know, religion and state. You also have to have the economic engine. It's like everyone wants to be Hong Kong. You know, um, and, uh, but you know, you, you got to be able to balance Chinese entrepreneurship and British rule of law. You know, that's what makes Hong Kong, Hong Kong. So I think you got to keep that in mind with Turkey. Over here, question. Yes, sir. Then. <laughs> I got the person further in from the microphone. Yes. How much of a role is Turkey playing on Afghanistan? I think uh, Turkey has been playing a, a very important accessory role in, in Afghanistan for a long time. Uh, it has been uh, actively involved. It doesn't have a combat role, but it has, a, has had a, 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 a command role. It has a command role today. It has been very close to Afghanistan for many years, well preceding the last 10 years, it has uh, good relations with that country. And by and large, I think, in a very limited way, uh, has been trying to nudge uh, uh, Afghanistan in a, as good a posture as might be expected at this time, which is not very good. But uh, uh, Turkey has a, a, an important constructive role there. And, uh, and the United States certainly has welcomed that uh, for a long time. It's a player. Next. <coughs> Way over here. Thank you, Eric Paloma from CSIS. My question is for Dr. Alariza. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, there, there have been some major developments in regards to relations between Damascus and Ankara, primarily kind of the recognition of the Free Syrian Army, which has a de facto forward operating base in Antakya now, also reports that there have been arms trafficking across the border of Hatay. Uh, what is the likelihood that a more aggressive or we'll say defensive posture from Damascus could provoke a Turkish response? Thank you. Now, the reference to the, uh, to the, uh, to the Turkish backing uh, for the armed group, such as it is headed by Colonel Assad, uh, no relation, I presume, uh, it was from the New York Times uh, report that we all read a couple of weeks ago. Now, Turkey has not officially uh, confirmed that it's backing uh, uh, such groups. What it's doing is it's allowing the Syrian opposition, the civilian opposition, to meet in Turkey. And in fact, last, last night, the foreign minister had a meeting uh, with that group pointedly a few hours after the attack on the Turkish embassy in uh, Damascus and the two Turkish consulates in Latakia and uh, uh, Aleppo, I believe. Um, now, once you get involved uh, uh, in this kind of thing, what I mean is if you give open support to a group that's trying to overthrow um, another government, no matter how uh, uh, despicable it is, then you've certainly crossed a, a line uh, in international relations. And I'm not sure that Turkey's at that point yet. Turkey's uh, very unhappy with what's going on over, over there. From the Prime Minister down, they've expressed uh, great unhappiness. That great unhappiness has been expressed at that level. Uh, but whether it will actually cross the line 
uh, and give open support to, uh, to a group that wants to overthrow Damascus uh, is, is, is something that I'm not sure the Turkish government is willing to do. Because think of the uh, government in, in Damascus doing the same with the PKK. It hosted the PKK for a long time. The leader of the PKK, who is now in a Turkish jail, Abdullah Öcalan, was based in Damascus for a long time. Then you have entered uh, uh, the, the kind of uncharted territory in international relations that you worry about. Now, the US is looking to Turkey uh, to play uh, a, a more important role. The Europeans who met today are looking to Turkey to play a more important role. Uh, you know, that unfortunate phrase that was used, leading from behind, uh, uh, when it is applied to Syria, may have Turkey being uh, up front uh, in a way that other countries were up front on, on Libya. But I'm not sure that Turkey's at, at that point where it's willing to do some of the things that you refer to. Is there a hand back here? Rich Kosslerich from George Mason University. A couple of years ago, we were hoping that there would be a, an opening between Turkey and Armenia. And due to perhaps some miscalculation about Azerbaijan, that did not happen. With 2015 approaching and the 100th anniversary of the tragedy against the Armenians in Turkey, how do you see Turkish-Armenian relations uh, evolving over the next couple of years? Who would like to take that? Go ahead. Um, I'm very pessimistic. Uh, the opening was very much encouraged by the US. Uh, President Gül had taken the, the lead. And in fact, uh, President Obama, um, uh, not last year, but the year before, explained his uh, uh, unwillingness to use the word genocide uh, in referring to the events of, of 1915, had referred to the, to the process of normalization. Uh, clearly, the uh, reaction from Azerbaijan, which may not have been taken into account, was a factor in the decision by Prime Minister Erdogan to apply the brakes on this issue. Now, the U.S. still wants something to happen uh, to avoid a, um, a, you know, unpleasant developments in, in Congress uh, in 2015, uh, but the, the process is completely stuck. Now, as you know, uh, Turkey recognized Armenia as one of the successor states to, uh, to the Soviet Union, and that border was actually open until 1993, and it was closed because of the, the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So the first step that one would think of uh, you know, in a step-by-step -step approach uh, to rapprochement, the opening of the border, is stuck because of the, uh, the Turkish insistence on the withdrawal of uh, the Armenians, or at least the beginning of the withdrawal from the Armenian uh, occupied, the Azeri occupied territory that the Armenians currently have. I'm totally pessimistic that, uh, that anything's gonna happen, in fact, uh, uh, one of the reasons for my pessimism is that it's not even being discussed seriously in, in Turkey. Turkey is now busy with uh, what's going on south of its border rather than what's going on uh, on the other side of uh, uh, the world. Go ahead. Uh, Rich, you've got four years still. A lot can happen in four years. And, and, uh, and uh, I would not preclude changes in Turkey, Turkey's attitudes on how to deal with this. And I would not preclude a, a very active diplomacy, perhaps changing this. Boulet is right to be pessimistic. It's like on Cyprus. You can't be optimistic about Cyprus. <laughs> it's just impossible. But on, on this one, I think uh, uh, there's a possibility of some sort of movement. Maybe I'm smoking pot, but I do. <laughs> I take it. I take a, 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 less, a less negative perspective. Right here, this time. Uh, good evening. Major Howard Beasy, Headquarters, Marine Corps International Affairs. Uh, with the upper hand seemingly gone to the AKP and the longstanding rivalry between the military counterbalance, uh, what do you make of that first, and does that free up Turkey to uh, exercise a more uh, hard power foreign policy, uh, they have sort of the military underfoot. I don't see the connection. Uh, um, you know, why would Turkey be m more able to play exercise hard power because of the changes in the civilian military balance in Turkey? But you know, what you're referring to, leaving that to one side, what you're referring to is, is, a, is a very important development. It, it happened because of the, uh, the EU process. What was previously th uh, thought unthinkable in, in, in Turkey has happened because uh, there was pressure from the EU. The Copenhagen political criteria demanded that the civilians exercise control over, over the military. 
and the military has, uh, has lost a great deal of its power. Nonetheless, you know, uh, if you're sitting in, uh, uh, in the Prime Minister's office and you want to fight the PKK, and you want to be able to project power into uh, force into, into northern Iraq, you still look to the Turkish armed forces. Still very uh, uh, powerful instrument, but uh, it is not as influential as, as it used to be. And broadening the discussion uh, just a little bit more. Uh, you know, we're sitting in the middle of Washington uh, talking about this. Uh, the core of the, of the US-Turkish relationship uh, in the alliance that was constructed in the Cold War was the relationship between the Pentagon and the Turkish general staff. Now, the TGS is not as influential uh, as it used to be. The Cold War is, of course, no more. And the US is looking to Turkey to exercise not soft power, not hard power, but much more soft power in the lands uh, to the south and heal some of the divisions between uh, the, um, the US and the Islamic world that uh, had been revealed during, the, uh, during and after the, the Iraq war. Now there, the, uh, the uh, Turkey under Ak uh, can and has played a role. Whether it will be able to maintain that kind of influence, either in conjunction with the US or on its own, once it begins to try and use hard power, is much more debatable. Anyway, right here. We've got time for about two more questions. Uh, <coughs> Peter Sharfman. Uh, all of you have spoken of the driving force of geography on Turkish poli driving force that geography imposes on Turkey. But are there other factors? Are there considerations of Turkish aspirations for what they want to be 20 years from now or so that also play a role in Turkish policy. Who'd like to tackle that? I think uh, there are some major unresolved issues here in Turkey. Uh, and there, first of all, is Turkish democracy and what happens and how they handle the increasingly difficult Kurdish issue. That is, to me, a major uncertainty. The second still is, what is the role of religion in Turkish political life? A lot of people, rightly or wrongly, are deeply concerned about what they think is happening. The third is, is whether there is an increasing authoritarian uh, uh, trend in Turkey, leading to a, a, a further AKP control. All those, these are practical issues being debated and discussed in Turkey. I'm not trying to lend a, 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 a negative notion that somehow or other Turkey's going to fail to meet these. I'm just saying these are the present preoccupations of Turkish domestic political life. And they have to be, and how, or rather how Mr. Erdogan deals with them is, is coming very much to the fore over this coming year. Final question. Firth at CSIS. I just wanted to add something to the question about Turkey and Afghanistan, the question that was asked. There's something else that Turkey's doing. It has its hands full with a lot of issues, one of which is to be a convener for a regional conference yeah. last week in Istanbul. It's the first time that all of the neighbors and near neighbors in Afghanistan have gotten together. Turkey was able to pull off something that they couldn't pull off a year ago which was to get India and Pakistan together for the first time in a regional setting to discuss what's going to happen with the future of Afghanistan. So Turkey is playing a key role there, and that's going to be sort of a setup to the Bonn conference uh, in December. But the regional diplomacy push that Turkey is doing is enormously hopeful if there's going to be any kind of regional settlement for Afghanistan. So Turkey's got an important role to play. What was the result of that conference, Rick? I'm sorry? What was the result of that conference? It was a eight-page declaration. <laughs> no, no, wait, wait a minute. Well, that's, but that's <laughs> there, there have been previous declarations. But the fact that they got everybody together for the first time, and the fact everyone is looking over its shoulder that the US is withdrawing, 
maybe that will be an impetus for the regional people to find some way to keep their hands out of meddling in Afghanistan in the future. It's a long shot, but at least Turkey is being proactive in trying to bring all the players together. So that's why I applaud what they've done. Won't give them a great odds of success, but it's necessary and it's something actually that the U.S. government has been pursuing now uh, through the regional initiative and the so-called New Silk Road approach. So I give Turkey a hand for that. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rick. And thank you all for coming on behalf of CSIS and CCU.